Frau Bundeskanzlerin. Mrs. Chancellor, the applause just shows how much you have been expected, and I am, of course, delighted, particularly delighted that you have chosen to join us. You really belong to the family here in Davos. The last time you addressed us was mainly during the years of the crisis. And as many have said to me, your presence helped to calm things very much because you were able to show us clearly that uh, Europe is not completely without any leadership. Well, we have reached a critical point in time again. That is a general sentiment. We are uh, faced with a very important decision taken by the ECB today, so I'm really very, very interested and hanging on your lips to hear what you have to say to us. A very warm welcome, Madam Chancellor. Well, Professor Schwab, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me say that I'm delighted uh, to be able to be here uh, this year again. Last year, unfortunately, I was uh, uh, not able to attend the World Economic Forum and to answer questions. May I also point out the fact that uh, there are a number of members of my cabinet present here today, and I think this clearly shows that Germany is more than ready and willing to engage in international debates and discussions. You have, um, uh, as you always have, um, a very ambitious motto committed to improving the state of the world. I think quite a lot needs to be done if one takes this to heart. And this year has actually um, started uh, with um, a bang uh, that woke up all uh, us up and, and shook us to the core with this terrible attack um, uh, against uh, Jewish citizens and um, also against um, the journalists um, in Paris, against uh, police forces. That dr shows us all that we are facing challenges that stop not at the borders of Europe, not in the borders of the United States, but that is indeed a global fight, the fight against Islamist terror. And these attacks, I think, have woken up us, uh, thoroughly, woken us up thoroughly, and we have seen this very impressive demonstration uh, in the streets of Paris with millions um, of um, French men and French citizens. And I think it has shown very clearly how much we felt with um, the relatives of those who were killed. But we also stood up for our values, for our values of, of freedom of the prince, of freedom of democracy, freedom of religion, um, freedom of expression. And we also had to learn, as we had to learn during the year 2014, that those matters that we've always taken for granted, also in Europe, also in the democracy, um, of the West needs to be fought for time and again, needs to be defended time and again. And this may well be one of the most important messages that we need to um, bring to our citizens, that we need to discuss with our citizens. This vibrant principle of democracy um, must be our answer to a repression and to terrorism. But it is not something that can be imposed from above, this principle of democracy. It has to be filled with life through the freedoms that the citizens have. Because citizen uh, freedom does not mean being free of something, but to be free to do something, to shoulder responsibility. Each and every one where he or she stands. And in this 25th year of German unity, that is something that is particularly important to, you, to us. We will celebrate the 25th anniversary of uh, German unity this year, and we will not only pay lip service to this tenet, we will try to fill this principle with life. Last year, we were confronted um, in quite a different way with uh, um, problems that we had not um, actually expected um, to quite this extent, um, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. You had the Ukrainian president here. He addressed you. He um, explained how he sees the situation from his vantage point. And let me say, on behalf of my government and as German chancellor, there is one thing that we hold very important, namely the fact that this here elementary principles of the European peaceful order were violated. The annexation of Crimea is not just any kind of 
annexation, but it is a clear and flagrant violation of what has made us live peacefully and coexist peacefully together in Europe after the war, namely respect of our borders and respect of the territorial integrity of our partner countries. And this is so important because Ukraine, after all, gave up its um, nuclear arsenal because there was a Budapest memorandum, guarantee powers such as UK, uh, Russia and the United States um, stood guarantor uh, for the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Which other country would then follow that example to give up its nuclear arsenal if it has this example um, uh, before its very eyes? Um, if you give that up, then uh, you are making yourself uh, weaker and more vulnerable to this kind of attack. But we've also learned from the world wars here in Europe that a military response uh, to such a challenge uh, cannot uh, be successful. There is no military solution to this, and this is why sanctions were unavoidable. They are not an end in themselves, and they can also be lifted if the reasons um, for why they have been um, imposed in the first place are no longer there, but we're not there yet. I would like to underline here that the whole of Europe, but particularly we in Germany, time and again, together with the French president, try in the so-called Normandy format to bring about a diplomatic solution. The foreign ministers of this uh, Normandy format met uh, yesterday. Um, there are certain small um, uh, steps to, uh, towards uh, progress, uh, although there are many setbacks as well. The Minsk agreement, at any rate, is the basis on which these negotiations take place and we try to find a solution. Ladies and gentlemen, apart from these global challenges, there are also challenges of an economic nature um, and challenges to our societies as a whole. This year, Germany is in the chair of the G7, and those issues that we consider to be of uh, prime importance for the long-term and sustainable development of our world is something that we wish to work on, protection of the climate, reduction of poverty, fight, uh, fight against antimicrobial uh, uh, resistance, and also uh, I take this issue particularly to heart, empowerment of women to set up their own business. What is also important is to make them more stronger, economically speaking. Europe continues to be confronted by great challenges. We quite often talked about the um, sovereign debt crisis, about the crisis in the euro area. We have this somewhat under control now, but we are not out of the woods yet. We have not overcome it, and Europe, more essentially, hasn't really regained sufficient trust, hasn't regained sufficient competitiveness. I am always for not painting matters in black and white. Quite often, so-called austerity is pitted against the so-called growth model. Um, I think that this is totally wrong. We need a growth-oriented sound fiscal policy, we need investments, we need investments by the state, but we first and foremost need an environment uh, which um, encourages private investors to take out investments. And if today, um, in these very minutes, um, we expect a uh, decision by the European Central Bank, then this will be a decision that will be taken uh, totally independent. Um, let me state this very clearly. We in Germany, as you know, have this long tradition of time and again stressing that the ECB is um, independent and should be independent, but as a politician, no matter what, I would say, no matter what sort of decision the ECB will take. We should not become diverted by from the fact that we need to put as politicians the necessary framework conditions in place for recovery. And we have progress in quite a number of countries, particularly the so-called program countries. We have very clear reform um, efforts, um, for example, also in Italy. I say finally, the, um, you've had the Italian Prime Minister here addressing you. These are very important signs. In France, there is a new course and that is clearly uh, growth-oriented, which is a very good um, uh, message and, a very, and very good news, but time is of the essence because every day these adjustment mechanisms um, are not done and that we sort of wait uh, with improve for um, until we improve our competitiveness is a lost day. We need jobs and these jobs have to be created in those areas which um, promise long-term highly qualified employment. So digitization 
and the, how we react in Europe to digitization and this phenomenon it will be essential. Germany is uh, very pleased that um, it is our commissioner, um, the German commissioner who is responsible for this particular industry um, and it is, I think, a very good sign that the European Commission has not only launched an investment program um, but is also looking at the political framework conditions. But a sober look at um, the digital agenda and of Europe and the role of the United States and also of a number of Asian countries very clearly shows that we lag behind. Um, we have to try to close that gap. We're not leading um, the development here. So we need to put the political framework condition in place, as I said. We need to find the right mix, the right balance of in protection of the data of the individual, but also freedom to use those data to um, develop new products. And as German Federal Chancellor, I want our strong German economy um, to be able to um, actually um, cope with this merger of the so-called real economy and the digital um, economy to what is uh, commonly called Industry 4.0. And uh, because otherwise, we will lose out competition. competition in the competition. And we, um, I think, enter into this competition with self-confidence, but uh, we haven't yet uh, won that. Um, I think we have in Europe, with this uh, huge single market that we have, very good opportunities, but Europe become, must become more rapid, must become, must become faster, must become more uh, competitive and less regulated. I am very pleased that this Commission has set itself the goal uh, to, to do that. For the first time, we have this um, um, trilogue between um, the European Commission, the European Parliament and the European Council and I think if we work on this basis um, of this new agenda that we have given ourselves, we have a very good opportunity, a very good chance of getting stronger out of this crisis, out of this European crisis than we went in. And the, the examples of um, Spain, of Portugal, of Ireland and also in parts of Greece show that um, actually reforms are well worth your while. They are efficient and growth can return. What does Germany do? In this competition, Germany wants to play a responsible role. I think we've shown that um, growth-oriented, sound fiscal uh, consolation is possible in 2014. For the first time uh, for 40 years, we have not um, any new net borrowing in our um, budget. And I know that some people accuse us of being uh, too uh, tight with our money, as it were, um, as regards our budgetary policy. But let me remind you that Germany has a massive demographic challenge, as probably no other European country has. More than six million people will be lost to our market um, who are now gainfully employed because they retire. And if we're not solid in the way that we do our business and try to keep our debts down, then we will leave a very heavy burden to the next generation. They will simply not have the necessary breathing space, and I think that this would be irresponsible. We're one of the few member countries of the European Union that spends 3% uh, of its uh, GDP on research and development. I think um, we're attractive to others because of that um, for research and development. Private consumption has um, increased. Um, it is actually carrying um, and boosting economic growth. The um, growth has been 1.5 percent, which may be compared to the U.S., is somewhat modest, but for us it is quite respectable. We want to continue uh, this course. We also want to continue uh, this course of increasing employment. We have as many people in jobs, um, gainfully in gainful employment, um, as we've ever had um, during our history. Um, and um, those are very, very good figures that we have in this um, area, um, particularly uh, 43 million people in gainful employment of 80 million inhabitants, and um, we want to remain a stable um, anchor uh, in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know we cannot shut ourselves off against the rest of the world, and we shouldn't do this. So let me plead for the European Union being an open-minded uh, place for ag agreeing on free trade investments. Um, the CETA, for example, the uh, free trade agreement with Canada is almost there. It needs to be finalized. Um, TTIP is currently under negotiation. The um, American president has committed himself uh, to these negotiations, and I think that is a unique chance for Europe, that it should seize 
Opportunities for growth can in this way be speeded up and through less obstacles in transatlantic trade. But what's also important is we have very high standards in consumer protection um, and generally around in industrial production as well. So we could do something in order to be standard setters globally and we can only do that if we do that together with the United States and which this is why I will come out um, very strongly in favor of this and we'll work for it um, tirelessly. Ladies and gentlemen, we're challenged, not only economically speaking, but also as regards um, standing up for our values. The digital world creates a situation where there are no secrets anymore, no <clears throat> uncharted waters, as it were. The civil societies want to know what's happening. They want to know um, how the world is governed. Uh, they want transparency. And we are looking forward to this kind of challenge. We don't want to always talk about the risks, as so many people do. We want to see the opportunities. We want to be a good partner in Europe and in the world. Thank you very much. A warm thank you, Madam Chancellor. Perhaps I may come back very briefly to the key parts of your presentation, your speech. You spoke about the conflicts, conflict situations that are prevailing. And if I could just touch upon the Ukraine, I'd say that the first objective must be to implement the Minsk agreement or protocol. But what do you think is the long-term outlook you are in contact permanently, so with the main actors in this conflict. What is the way out of this conflict? Because the longer it lasts, the more it will cost for everyone involved. What is the way out of this conflict? Well, in order to solve a conflict, you always need to. And uh, let me assure you that we shall not relent in our efforts uh, to bring this conflict to a solution. Our objective is to uphold the territorial integrity of Ukraine. It needs to be restored short term, first in the Lugansk and Donetsk um, area, but Crimea obviously is not forgotten, but Lugansk and Donetsk are uh, very urgent, very pressing. Our demand is, and gem that is something that was a positive experience for our country, that a country um, needs to be able to determine freely where it wants to go. But it's also true that there are very close linkages, particularly in the economic area between Russia and Ukraine. So it would be desirable to be able, on the basis of the Minsk agreement, to first restore some kind of stability. And then later on, in a bigger picture um, between the European Union and the Eurasian Union try to explore uh, possibilities of cooperation in an economic area uh, that uh, President Putin himself called uh, from Vladivostok to Lisbon and to cooperate because that after all needs to be our objective. I hope that opportunities uh, will present um, themselves and I think maybe once we have that then these um, uh, discussions about association uh, difficulties between um, Russia and Ukraine may well be solved, We're, and, and also the EU, um, sorry, and Ukraine, but with the, we are ready to do that, um, but uh, we have to have a ceasefire, we have to have a regaining of control um, of uh, Ukraine at the along the border uh, with Russia, and this process has to be initiated. There are many, too many lives um, that have been lost. In may I then just follow up here when the wall came down? A lot was said about this common European house. Is this principle still valid? Oh, of course, of course it is still valid. You see, we have um, actually created quite a lot of avenues for cooperation. There is this um, NATO-Russia founding act. Uh, there are economic ties between the European Union and Russia. Uh, Russia, through this Eurasian Union, uh, wants those to be uh, lifted and extended uh, to EU uh, Eurasian Union. Uh, we, um, as Germany, have a strategic partnership with Russia, and part and parcel of that, a very important part of that, was diversification of the economy uh, there, help them. So I think there were um, 
efforts, very good efforts. And I also, in the first grand coalition we had, worked together with our um, German foreign minister um, as probably um, the only voice in Europe that we don't want to have a too hasty um, rapprochement of uh, Ukraine and Georgia to NATO because we know about the sensitivity of Russia and um, and, and we know um, that this may well um, well uh, be difficult for them. I now am um, in a way being um, accused of that and um, said people tell to me but what has that brought and now I'm again um, saying don't um, cut off the bridges that we built. Uh, we have good will, but you will understand a continent that has known in its history so many shifting of borders and had, has, has such a painful memory of that simply cannot simply gloss over violation of the principle of territorial integrity. I think there's a general understanding for that. Yes, but the question is sometimes what are we ready to uh, actually do to put on the table um, when because when I, uh, people are talking about imposing of sanctions or even uh, making them stronger, then people say, but we have disadvantages. And I say, yes, but disadvantages are even greater when the legal certainty is no longer there. One has to defend one's convictions and stand by them. This brings me to the second key point of your speech, and that is European stability. We have a feeling in the last few months that there were like two different schools of thought or two religions. And you touched upon this. The ECB is going to take a decision today, but we don't know what this decision is going to be. But we feel that maybe one stream of thought or school will have one. But you were indicating that both could be combined. But now the doors seem to be wide open. I think... Um, our life experience tells us that there's very rarely a black and white solution. And I always um, say to my people that a process and the euro crisis is an ongoing process, has been going on for quite some time, never to look at such a crisis only uh, in small slices. I very well remember those times when the spreads for um, state bonds were beyond 4, 4, 4 and 5 percent, um, and this at uh, debt rates of uh, um, 80 90 percent and that gets a very unpleasant situation for um, a country at the time we thought that it may well be a message of trust to the financial markets when we say this whole um, sovereign debt um, needs to be drawn down step by step and what we said then I think continues to be valid but nobody said that this works very well when you have no growth everyone knows uh, I mean it's conventional wisdom that this works very well when you have growth now how does one generate growth there are different opinions of, um, over this. Uh, quite often people talk about the state needing to do more, needing to invest more. That plays an important role, but it's not the most crucial role when you don't have at the same time matching private investments. Now we have a situation where there's so much liquidity in the markets that I am very certain that the spreads for state bonds cannot be dramatically cheaper. So if you are not able to remain within the bounds of your budget now and have um, three, four percent uh, deficit per year, I don't know what's going to happen to you once um, the interest rates and the spreads are going up again. So now is the time to do your homework as regards your fiscal consolidation. Um, through these very, in these times of very low interest rates. The ECB, let me underline this yet again very clearly, is an independent organization, but as a politician, because so many people seem to mix so many things. Um, I think it is most important that we are even more stringent in um, the way we do business than allowing ourselves to be uh, tempted to buy time and not do structural reforms. Let me say yet again, Italy is doing very ambitious uh, reforms, and France is on the way to do that, and others have already done it. Of course, it's a controversial debate, also within the ECB, as we know. I'm not, I'm not uh, um, surprised about that, because the world actually has quite a high level of liquidity at its disposal. And this supply of liquidity 
a little bit, well, sort of uh, erect a smokescreen, so you don't quite know who is actually competitive and who's not. We don't get a clear picture of our true capacities and of our true and genuine economic strength. And at some point in time, when this smokescreen has lifted, it will become apparent again. We've seen that when we saw the decision of the Swiss um, Central Bank. All of a sudden, there is a difference, a very marked difference between the, franc, the Swiss franc and the euro. And we must prepare for this day. And then nobody can say, oh, I didn't know about that. That is the only point um, where I try to say to people, people, we don't as yet have as conduce and as positive an environment as we need it, for example, for investment in the digital uh, area. I know that there's a broad-based discussion here in Davos, and I think we would be well advised to be better prepared for this innovation. Madam Chancellor, <coughs> at the end of this week there's going to be event, elections in Greece, and there's been a lot of talk and worry about the so-called Grexit, and I'm quite sure that European solidarity will stand fast. But perhaps uh, you would like to say something briefly about this? Well, the elections will only take on place on Sunday, so um, I certainly will not... Um, preempt that result, but we hear from German, uh, from Greece sorry, that the vast majority uh, in Greece wishes to remain in the euro area and likes to be in the euro area. And um, ever since that crisis started, I've always said that everything we do politically is oriented towards Greece remaining part of the euro area. Um, and there are two things that need to be in place. Um, we need to show solidarity, um, and we will continue to show solidarity, coupled with um, the um, readiness to shoulder one's own responsibility. I'm convinced that Greece will continue to show that sense of responsibility too. And what um, then uh, what happens after the elections is something that we will discuss then. Um, we and that is, after all, the experience of the um, European policy and European route through that euro crisis. We've always found a European solution, but always based on these two matching sides of the coin, solidarity and um, own responsibility. Madam Chancellor, if I may put a more personal question. We've spoken a lot here about the lack of confidence, which is linked to the fact that there may not be much leadership. Where leadership weakens? In, in, in the world of politics in general. Of course, there are exceptions, and I will name no names. But this means that the greater pressure pressure on you, more expectations um, weigh on you and on Germany. How do you see that? I think if you look at the European Union as a whole, um, there are 28 member states, 19 of them now um, members of the Eurozone, and at the level of heads of state and government, uh, we can only ever take unanimous decisions. So no matter whether I'm a small country, I'm a big country, whether I feel more important or less important, doesn't matter. In the end, all, uh, each and every one has to be convinced of one and the same thing, and that we've always been able, even in the most difficult times, sometimes under time pressure, sometimes sometimes a bit too slow, um, sometimes perhaps not only uh, in a perfect way, that we've always been able to do that, I think, is a very uh, convincing statement, I think um, um, she was using the, the English term, statement. Um, that speaks to um, our strength. So I think we're quite a good institution compared to others in the world. Let's say if we were able to do a bit more, to be a bit more curious uh, towards what happens in other part of the world, um, engage in a little less um, navel-gazing, a little less parochial policies, I think we can be even better. And I must say I'm very pleased and a little bit proud to be part of the European Union. I too, I too. But, Madam Chancellor, for strong leadership, you also need coordination, vision, and within this meaning, I would like to con congratulate you for this vision of a digital Europe 
We have to play the role that we can, and that is within the possibilities and the means of Europe. I'm sure that we'll have the opportunity of discussing this more later on today. But thank you so very much for having joined us today. I would also like to include in my thanks the members of your cabinet, and on behalf of all the participants here, I would like to wish you all success for everything that you're doing and also all the best for the period of the presidency of the G7. And may I, may I also invite you to stay seated. We have a very small celebration now, which will take about five minutes. So please remain seated.